As you meditate, you want to bring the whole mind to the breath. And sometimes it's easy. You're in the mood. Everybody in the mind is in the mood. And they all can settle down. At other times, some members of the committee would rather do something else. They have their other agendas, their other desires. And even though they may let you focus on the breath for a few minutes, they're going to try to sabotage it. You've got to realize, as John Lee says, there's more than one mind in the mind. There are lots of minds in here, lots of intentions. And it's a problem in the med meditation, but it can also be something that helps you in the meditation if you learn to see the mind as a committee. Because that helps you pull away from some of the more unskillful voices, even though they're very loud in the mind and very insistent. You don't have to identify with them. When you say that you're not in the mood to meditate, which part is not in the mood? Which part is in the mood? Why is the part that is in the mood overcome by the other side? Well, the other side may have lined up with certain sensations in your body that seem to be pretty insistent and pretty permanent. Or you can pry it loose. You say, okay, this is a voice in the mind, and the sensation is something separate. There may be a dull feeling, a feeling of a lack of energy. And the lazy voice has latched onto that. I'll try to pry them loose, pry them apart. The physical sensation is one thing, the voice is something else. It's providing an interpretation. It's providing a spin. And just as you have to learn how to look for spin when you're reading newspapers and magazines, you have to look for spin in your own mind. To recognize it as that, it's placed an interpretation on events which you don't have to agree with, and see which part of the mind is a little bit wiser. If the mind were one single unit, you either have to be inherently good or inherently bad. If we're inherently bad, there'd be nothing you could do to meditate. You could never trust yourself. If you're inherently good, there'd be no need to meditate. But it's because we have this committee that, on the one hand, we need to meditate, but on the other hand, we can. Simply learning how to strengthen the healthy voices inside. And learning how to rely on yourself more and more to be able to do this. Often when we're in a bad mood, we depend on other people to get us out of the bad mood. That's the way it is in regular human society. But going off alone, spending some time alone here at the monastery, requires you to learn how to manage yourself, how to disidentify with your bad moods, and how to, for the time being, side with your good moods, your wiser moods, your more skillful moods. and learn the tricks of the unskillful side. It's not that they're totally lacking in skill, it's just their skills are aimed at the wrong thing. A short-sighted happiness, a short-sighted pleasure. And they have their tricks and their subterfuges to make you see things their way. So you've got to teach your good side some tricks and subterfuges. Teach it to be insistent, teach it to be more strategic. It can be anything from promising yourself a reward at the end of the medita meditation. If you stick with the breath for this hour, okay, you've got a reward. Or you can make a game of it. See how long you can stay with the breath this time. The important thing is if you find yourself falling off the breath that you not get upset. Because when you get upset, that's when the 
unskillful voices can move in, take advantage of the opportunity, and start berating you and making you feel bad and pulling you further and further away from the practice. When things go very good, you have to be careful too, because then the unskillful voices slip in and get you complacent. So it has to be part of the mind that steps back and watches these things. It's not too quick to identify with any particular voice. Even the voices that sometimes seem like the Dharma police coming in to berate you for not being a good meditator. Well, those are your defilements too, you know, unless you can convert them to the point where they simply notice, okay, you're off the path here, let's move over a little bit and get back on the path. When you're on the path, okay, you don't have to add any further commentary, just stick with it and try to be more careful the next time. Like the policeman who, instead of giving you a ticket, simply gives you a warning and sends you on your way. You find that this relates to the different members of the committee as you go through the day, the kinds of conversations you have with yourself, the kinds of things they say to one another. It is important, and it's an important part of the practice to learn how to keep watch over these voices all the time. Because if certain patterns of conversation get established during the day, you'll find that they resurface during the meditation. And if they're unskillful, okay, it's going to cause trouble in your meditation. So you've got to keep watch over this constant committee chatter all the time. Try to keep the committee going in the good direction. This is a huge part of the meditation. We like to think of meditation is all about getting the mind really still, very quiet, nothing being said by anybody anywhere in the mind. And there are stages in the meditation where things are very, very quiet. But you don't get there simply by squashing all conversation. You have to learn how to conduct more skillful conversations inside. The things you focus on, the kind of commentary you make on those things. You've got to keep tabs on this. And when you see that an unskillful voice is taking over, you need to learn how to pull yourself out of it so you don't identify with it. As the Buddha said, all fabrications are not self. And this verbal fabrication of the mind is not self. And so for the time being, you want to use that principle selectively. Anything that's unskillful, okay, learn how to pull out. It's like those times when you're in a dream and you begin to realize there's something really wrong with this dream. To the point we finally realize it is a dream. That's what's wrong with it. Then you wake up. And it's the same with the different voices in the mind. You can wake up from them. Just learn how to recognize when there's something wrong with the voice, either in its tone or what it has to say, or just noticing the effect that it has on the mind if you take on that identity. And learn how to question the need, question the desire that you have to have that identity. We've learned some pretty unskillful identities over time, but we have a few skillful ones too, otherwise we wouldn't be here. It's simply a matter of learning how to strengthen the skillful ones, not get deluded into slipping back into the old roles, unskillful roles that you played in the past. So take it for granted, there will be a fair amount of chatter going on in the meditation. And don't regard it simply as a nuisance. It has its role. It's very important that you learn how to conduct the conversation in a skillful way. Learn how to hold the meeting in such a way that the unskillful forces don't take over. 
And when you can, you try to convert them. Because after all, all the voices here are simply the expression of a desire for happiness and ideas about how that happiness can be attained. And so when you can convert different ideas to the idea that this, this is really where you want to look, this is really what you want to do, you've made it that much easier. To learn how to use this committee, instead of being annoyed by it or overwhelmed by it, the you here being, as a John Munn once said, the determination not to come back and suffer. So try to equip that determination with its weapons of discernment and mindfulness. So you can develop all the other qualities of the path that you need to make that determination a reality.